Hello, my name is Nancy and I am one of the registered nurse transition coordinators that work with the total joint department here at Providence Hospital in Everett. We have decided to make a online version of the course in the event that you are not able to make it in to attend the course in person. And if you have attended the course in person and you'd like to watch the video again, you can watch this online version of it. Today, Keenan Forey, one of the uh, supervisors on 10 North, the, the floor that uh, folks that go to, that have the total joint surgery go to, um, will be teaching in addition to myself. I'm, we are both RNs and um, we were involved in the creation and the carrying out of the total joint program. The information that I will share with you today has been um, vetted by and created with the total joint surgeons, the orthopedic surgeons, and the physical and occupational therapists, as well as nurses. The information that I'll cover is available in a packet that I will review the contents of in just a few short minutes. Note that this class is designed to uh, teach both folks that are having a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement. We've genericized the content so that we can uh, catch a broader audience with our information, but know that the people that are caring for you after you've had your surgery are going to know that if you've had a hip or a knee surgery and what type of um, precautions you have, if any. I'd like to review the contents of this folder. You should have received one either from the hospital, from your doctor's office, or if you call us the transition coordinators, we can send you a copy to your home. The first thing that you'll find in the packet is this, the world's largest business card. This is me and my partners, the transition coordinators, and it gives you some information about us and how we follow you before, during, and after your hospital stay. And you'll find just below our pictures is our phone number. Again, I'll give you the phone number several times, but um, it's listed on this card if you ever need to refer back to it. The next item that you'll find in the packet is a wallet medication record. It is designed to be folded like this so that it's the same size as your driver's license and you can carry it in your wallet. What we would like you to do with this form is fill it out with every medication that you have put in or on your body in the last 30 days. That way when, they're, when you're asked what medications you take routinely, you don't forget any of them. And by the medications that you've put on or in your body in the last 30 days, I mean prescription medications, anything you've purchased over the counter, perhaps you've bought at a specialty store like a supplement store or a CBD store, because it's very important that we know anything that you have in or on your body so that we can tell if there will be any sort of an interaction with any of the medications we intend to give you here at the hospital. A few examples of that include, I mentioned the CBD, if I was to give you pain medication in addition to CBD salves or creams that you may have put on your body, there can be an additive effect between the two. Another example is turmeric. That's something that people are now, it's sold for folks that have um, arthritis and it's not purchased through your doctor's office. Oftentimes it's purchased over email or over the phone, and um, we would not have any record of it if you didn't let us know. But it's important for you to know that it also increases your risk of bleeding. So we wanna make sure that we know everything that you put on or in your body in the last 30 days. Oftentimes people ask me, do you want me to list the medications that my doctor said to stop taking preoperatively? Yes, please list those as well, because even though your doctor is aware of it, we want the entire healthcare team to be aware of it as well. And that will help us to make decisions about what medications we should give you here in the hospital. The next form that's in the packet is about our discharge lobby. The discharge lobby is a new process that we have uh, started here at the hospital where we can increase throughput through the hospital, make the room available to folks that are coming out of surgery, and give you a comfortable place to stay where there's a registered nurse and a certified nurse's assistant that can uh, monitor you while you're waiting in the discharge lobby for your loved ones to pick you up. The pharmacy is also able to deliver medications to the discharge lobby when you go down there, as long as you do not have 
Kaiser insurance. Kaiser is the only insurance that requires that you go to their um, their um, office in order to pick up your medications. But um, if you do decide to use our medications uh, distribution from the pharmacy, you will need to also have a way to pay. We cannot add it onto your hospital bill, and uh, we usually take have you take your um, debit card or your Visa card, have it sent that home with your family. But you will need it again to pay for your medications as you're in the discharge lobby. We use the discharge lobby to keep you safe and warm while your loved one goes to pick up the car. They'll drive around, we'll give you directions on how to get there. There's a map inside here that I will not go over with in much detail, but just know that there's a map that we will show you how to get to the discharge lobby. There's also a camera outside, so when your loved one pulls up, they'll be able to, you'll be able to see that they're there, alert the staff that your loved one is present, and then the caregivers will assist you out and into the car. This form here is about frequently asked questions related to surgical site infections. I encourage you to read through this. Um, there's a lot of information that's helpful to you. Please don't read it while we're going through the slideshow, though, because it will be distracting. But just know that surgical site infections, when you have a total joint replacement, can be very um, cumbersome and uh, uncomfortable. You may need to have additional surgery to get it repaired. So we're going to do everything in our power to prevent you from getting a surgical infection. And we're going to want you to do everything in your control to do the same. So this next piece of information that I've got here is called our helpful information packet and it is for patients and families. Um, it's got a lovely picture of Providence Hospital on there. The part that's got the cross on there right there is 10 North. That's where our folks that have total joint replacement surgery go after they've had their surgery. Once you've passed through the recovery room, which Keenan will talk about <clears throat> in just a moment. If other information that's in here includes on the inside front cover, there's a picture of Kim Williams. She's our chief executive officer and also, she's also a nurse. And then um, the picture below her is of Barry Stuvey. He's the director of spiritual care. And uh, just to remind you at this point that we are a faith-based hospital. It's not required in, to be faith-based yourself in order to work here or be a patient, but you will see indications of faith throughout the hospital. You'll hear a prayer in the morning. There's a cross in every room, every patient room in the hospital, and there's a presence of uh, uh, spirituality throughout the hospital that I hope you'll find uh, refreshing and uh, helpful. The other thing that's in here I want to go over with you is on pages 12 and 13, sorry to flip through the book, and it talks about your rights and responsibilities as a patient. Now you have the right to be cared for by professionals that, that are able to um, help get you through this process, and you also have the responsibility to responsibility to help keep us posted on what you need. If you needed to use the restroom, for example, we don't want you to get up and go on your own. We need you to call us so that we can come and help. We also need you to keep us posted as far as your pain management. We may not be able to keep you pain free, but we will be able to keep you as comfortable as possible as long as we work on that together. So the next package of information that you'll find in here is, is an advanced directive toolkit. An advanced directive goes by many names, like a durable power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, an advanced directive, a living will, whatever you may want to call it. This is designed to help. It's, this is a legal document. The first several pages of it are designed to stimulate thought so that you are um, thinking about the different things that you may want to put into your advanced directive. But in a nutshell, an advanced directive is a, is a legal document that directs somebody to be able to speak on your behalf when you are not able to speak on your own behalf. It's not a requirement before you come into the hospital, but what we found is that if people get to the position where they cannot speak on their own behalf and they don't have somebody designated to do that, then um, it can become a little bit complicated know that in the state of Washington by default if you're married your spouse is your power of attorney without even filling out this form but without filling out this form if you don't have the conversation with your loved one they're not going to know exactly what to say on your behalf 
Again, this is helpful to stimulate conversation. The other thing that I'd like uh, people to be aware of is that if, let's say, you're divorced or widowed, then by default, if you have children, then your oldest adult child would be your durable power of attorney. Again, you're going to want to have that conversation with them. And if that would not be your first choice, you would want to have a conversation with the person that would be your first choice. Review this information that you fill out with them and get this form signed and notarized. There's two different ways that you can get this uh, officialized. One of them is to have two witnesses that are not related to you witness it. A um, couple pages, about page seven or eight in there. The other way that you can get it taken care of or legalized is by having a notary uh, witness you uh, signing the paper and using their uh, official stamp to make this a legal document. If you already have a durable power of attorney or living will and you've brought it into the hospital, it remains in effect until you make any change to it. But consider if you have such a thing, what kind of life changes you may have gone through since you filled it out. If it was filled out a long time ago, maybe you've gotten divorced, lost a loved one, um, you may want to relook at that before you come in. Again, it's not required for you to have it before you come into the hospital. We just find that it's helpful for folks to have it in place um, in the event that they run into complications, like I mentioned before. This is the total joint care notebook that was created by the doctors, the nurses, the therapists that um, work on your team. And this is the book that's going to guide the rest of the class. Yours doesn't have these fancy little tabs on it like mine does. It's just so that I can guide you to the right pages. So I'd like you to keep this handy while I go through the rest of the class. Now I'd like to talk just a bit about the perioperative period. That's the time before, during, and after your surgery. In the pre-op period, one of the things that you'll need to do is decide that you want to have the surgery with your surgeon. You'll determine a surgical date. You'll attend a pre-op appointment with the orthopedic surgeon or their PA. You'll also get some pre-op labs, and that's when you get a process. That's a process that we do that allows for medical clearance. In those uh, meetings, whether it's with your primary care physician or here at the hospital, in what we call the surgical home, whatever uh, venue that you have it done in, they will draw labs. They will. That's where you'll get your EKG done that shows your heart rhythm to make sure that you've gotten cardiac clearance and any other tests that may need to be done, such as chest x-rays or um, any other tests that may need to be done. If you have any questions about the results of the tests that have been done at your pre-op appointment, we would direct you back to the person that did it or the group that did it. If it was done at your primary care physician's office, we would, just, we would send you back to them. If your surgeon is the one that uh, directed you on where to go, you would either, either talk to your surgeon or the doctor that they direct you to talk to for the results. Even though the records may be in your chart, we don't always have access to all of those. So um, again, you're gonna wanna return to the person that ordered that uh, set of clearance tests for you. Um, another thing that we want folks to do is attend this class. Uh, usually we offer it uh, in person, but hopefully you find this to be a helpful way to uh, view it from the comfort of your own home or wherever you may be watching it, um, either as a backup to the class that you attended or um, if you live afar. Uh, anyway, we're glad that you're attending the class, so thank you. And the other thing that you're gonna get in the pre-op uh, period is a pre-op phone call from the transition coordinator, me and my team. We like to reach out to anybody that's having a total knee or a hip replacement to make sure that you have what you need in place when it's time for you to go home. As transition coordinators, we transition you to, through, and from the hospital. So if you needed placement, or if you needed home health, or if you needed um, follow-up appointments, or transportation, we would assist you in all of that. So that's the information that we're gonna gather from the pre-op phone call that you get from the transition coordinator. Other things that are expected of you preoperatively is to get your dental work done. If you intend to get your teeth cleaned or if you intend to have um, some major dental work, you're going to want to talk to your orthopedic surgeon about the major dental work.
But as far as your teeth cleaning goes, you'd want to get that done um, as far in advance of your surgery as possible. One of the things with total joint replacements is dental work afterwards can lead to an infection in the joint if not treated properly. So we would like you to reach out to your orthopedic surgeon for the first year after you've had your orthopedic surgery. Every time you're gonna go see a dentist, whether it's for a teeth cleaning or a cavity or anything like that, we want you to reach out to your orthopedic surgeon. After about a year, they're not gonna be following you anymore. You're gonna to need to reach out to your primary care physician. The one person that you wanna reach out to every single time when you're gonna make a dentist appointment of course is your dentist, but you want to have the conversation with them to remind them each and every time that you've had either a total knee or a total hip replacement, because that will remind them that they need to consider antibiotics or some sort of um, prevention of uh, infection for you. One of the questions that people ask me as well is, what if I get sick before surgery? If you have a cough or a cold, please notify, or any other illness, an infection, say you uh, cut yourself and it looks red and angry, please call your orthopedic surgeon's office and run it by them. They're gonna make the decision whether or not you are, uh, ha you have an infection preoperatively or if um, maybe they'd wanna let the um, cold run its course before they arrange for the surgery. Sometimes you may need additional medical workup before you are able to have surgery just to make sure that you're well enough that you can work through the um, post, post and pre-op period. Preoperatively, we also want you to arrange home or help at home for that first week. It's very important that you have somebody the first five to seven days that's with you around the clock. I mean, even in the middle of the night. When you get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night, you're gonna have pain medication on board, you're gonna be a little disoriented, and we really wanna have somebody there that can just be with you as you walk safely to the restroom. Or if you need a drink from the kitchen, or um, if you need uh, help into and out of the bed, usually it's not heavy work that we're requesting of your care coach, the person that's gonna be there with you that first week, but um, just to have another set of eyes and ears on you post-operatively, we really want to, have, to make, keep you safe. So arrange help for that first week. Also, consider who can transport you to and from the hospital. So we understand that families are busy and sometimes they can't take time off from work. Um, it's okay to have somebody like a taxi, sometimes Uber, or Lyft. People will have uh, transportation in by them. But when it's time for you to discharge, we really want your care coach to be at the hospital so we can do the training with them for your exercises and um, follow through things that we want them to be looking out for in addition to things we want you to be looking out for for the first uh, time after the surgery, usually for the, about the first month. Um, also, if you wear nail polish and you intend to get your nails done, please make sure that you leave your pinky ring pinky finger nail bare. There's a tool that they use in surgery that they need to be able to read the oxygen level and some of the new uh, nail polishes that are out there are just too thick and too cumbersome for us to try and remove while you're here. So if you're gonna get your nails done, feel, right, feel free to do such a thing. Just make sure you leave us the pinky free of your non-dominant hand. If you smoke, you will heal better if you don't. So please make a plan with your doctor to quit or um, at least get a patch or gum while you're here in the hospital so that your body has a better chance at healing while you're here. The other thing that I'd like to refer to is practicing your pre-op exercises. On page 17 in the total joint care notebook that I've referred to is some pre-op exercises. Whether you're having knee or hip surgery, we want you to practice these exercises. There's a section a little farther in this video where we talk, the therapists will um, show you the exercises in a little more detail, but this is a, a helpful tool and they will refer to it when they're teaching their part as well. Continuing to talk about the pre-op time, we wanna make sure that two days before surgery, you start taking your pre-op showers. 
page 15 in the Total Care Notebook um, refers to that. And I'm going to go through a fair amount of detail going over how you should do your pre-op showers. There are instructions on here, but there's a couple of key points that I want you to really focus on that aren't highlighted in this particular section. The first thing is you want to make sure that you have fresh linen and clothes for each of the showers, which means as you're taking the shower, we want you to have fresh washcloth in there with you. When you come out of the shower, you should have a freshly laundered towel. If you use a separate towel for your hair, you should have a, a freshly laundered towel for your hair. And whatever clothes you put on when you leave the shower should be freshly laundered as well. You're going to take three preoperative showers. Two of them will be in the evening time. So let's say I'm going to have surgery on Monday morning. So I will take my first pre-op shower on Saturday evening, probably just before I go to bed. So when I get into my freshly laundered pajamas, when I'm ready to get into bed, I need to get into a bed that's got freshly laundered linens on it. You don't need to change your bedspread as long as your sheet goes, your top sheet goes over the top part of the bedspread so that your arms don't touch the bedspread. But fresh pillowcases, fresh bottom sheet, fresh, fresh top sheet after that first shower. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you should do that shower. The first thing that, um, well, I would like to let you know about the medication, the medicated soap that you will get at your pre-op appointment. If you have not had your pre-op appointment yet, don't fear, you will get a, a bottle of this when you go to your pre-op appointment. This medicated soap is called chlorhexidine gluconate or CHG. This bottle should get you through all three of your pre-op showers, so use it, use it wisely. The thing with chlorhexidine gluconate though is that you don't want to use it on your face, you don't want to use it to wash your hair, you don't want to use it to wash your armpits, and you don't want to use it on your private areas. But you need to get those areas clean, so how would you take the shower instead? Well, you take a regular shower first, where you wash your hair, you wash your face, you wash your armpits, you wash your private areas. And then you rinse that soap off, and then you turn off the shower. This part is not covered in the instructions, so just know that um, this is a key part of how this medication works best. So now you're going to take a fresh washcloth. If you use the first washcloth to wash the, at the beginning, you're going to want to use a fresh washcloth to put the chlorhexidine gluconate on. And this is where the little map shows of where the order, and I've got it on this slide as well, it shows you what order to clean with the chlorhexidine gluconate. So your chest, so we're standing in the, in the shower, the water's turned off, body's still wet, Take this chlorhexidine gluconate and you're going to clean the front of your chest. Then you're going to clean your arms, which is number two. Number three is the backs of your legs. Number four is your back. Now, with that section, I've only had one person in my class that was able to clean that section herself, and she was a yoga instructor. So unless you have the flexibility of a yoga instructor, you're going to need somebody to assist you with that part of the shower. So then after you do section four, then you're going to do the front parts of your legs, and then section five is your buttocks. Again, not cleaning that uh, private areas with the chlorhexidine gluconate. Now that that's all over your body and the areas that are listed here, you need to let the chlorhexidine gluconate sit on your skin for one minute. So start counting. Once you get to 60, you can turn the shower back on and rinse that off. When you're done with that, um, then you're going to, when you step out of the shower, then you're going to use that freshly laundered towel that we talked about, one for your hair and one for your body if that's what you need. They both need to be freshly laundered. And again, you're going to put on some clean, freshly laundered either pajamas or the day of your surgery, you're going to want to put on clothes, comfortable clothes that you're going to wear here to the hospital. One thing to note about the pre-op showers, with each one of them, I get questions when I teach the class, is, is it okay for my dog to sleep in my bed with me? And the answer to that question is no. You cannot guarantee that your dog does not have bacteria on them. You have done a great job doing the pre-op showers and you don't want to get bacteria back on you after having had that shower. But, so you'll need to find an alternate place for your dog to sleep if they typically sleep with you in the bed. 
Other questions I get about those pre-op showers is whether or not it's okay for my significant other, partner, spouse to sleep in the bed with me after I've taken the shower. And that's okay for them to share that bed with you, but they do need to take a shower of their own, not with the specialty soap, but they need to be uh, washed well, and then they also need to wear freshly laundered pajamas to bed. The additional thing we'd like you to be thinking about or arranging on the pre-op day two days before surgery is making sure that you have transportation at least to the hospital if not from as well, but both ways is a good idea. The day before surgery, we would like you to uh, pack a bag with some items that you're going to want to bring with you to the hospital. It's listed on page 16, but I kind of think of it as if I was doing an overnight trip somewhere, what things would I like to have with me? My toothbrush, my toothpaste, my personal deodorant. Um, if your skin is sensitive, you're going to want to bring your own soap. We also want you to pack some loose fitting clothes. These are the clothes that you're going to wear after you've had your surgery. Oftentimes people put on a couple of pounds in their surgery because we put so much fluid in, plus there's swelling, at, whether it's your knee or your hip, and you're going to have swelling in that area. You do not want to have tight fitting clothes to put on afterwards. Some people ask, is it okay to wear shorts? If you're comfortable wearing shorts, then that's fine. Um, it's up to you if you want to wear shorts or pants, but comfortable clothes like sweatpants or pajama bottoms, those are typical things that we have um, that folks will wear here. We also want you to wear closed toe and heeled shoes. We want You're gonna be learning how to walk again while you're here in the hospital, so we want you to be wearing shoes that you won't accidentally step out of. This is not a time to wear high heels. It's not a time to wear um, flip-flops. It's not a time to wear loose-fitting shoes that sometimes you step out of. So please make sure that you wear good, comfortable-fitting shoes. Um, a list of all your medications. Recall that yellow piece of paper that I reviewed earlier that um, you put everything that you've put in, in or on your body in the last 30 days. If you bring that list with you, it's really helpful for us to review. We'll review it several times prior to coming in, but um, so make sure that you bring that piece of paper with you as well. The only meds that we want you to bring are inhalers like rescue inhalers or eye drops. If you use a rescue inhaler and you need it like just one time, it's easier for us to uh, hand it to you and have you uh, use it than it is for us to try and order it and get a copy of it sent or get a version of it sent up to try and help and prevent you from having an asthmatic attack, for example. The other example of meds that we like to have you bring are eye drops. Most people use eye drops before they go to bed at night. You're only going to be here for one night for, as a standard rule of thumb, and so it wouldn't make sense to bring you a whole bottle of eye drops for a single drop. So you can bring them into the hospital, just your rescue inhalers and your eye drops. We can send them home with your family if we don't need them. The other items we would like you to bring into the hospital it include, if you use a CPAP machine, if you do, you know it, make sure that you bring it. We'd like it to be working properly. I've had people bring them in before and say, well, Nancy told me to bring in my CPAP machine, but it hasn't worked for six months. Well, we can't fix it while you're here, so please make sure that it's functioning properly when you bring it in. We do not have extra CPAP machines here in the hospital, and um, the closest thing we have to it is oxygen delivery, and it's just not the same. So please, if you use a CPAP, bring that in. We do have the distilled water that you might need for it, so make sure that when you bring it in that it's empty. The other things that we like you to bring are if you wear hearing aids, to bring those. If you wear glasses, to bring those. And if you wear dentures, please bring those as well. We want you to feel as comfortable as possible when you're out in the hallway walking. We want you to be able to hear what we're saying and see what you're doing and to be comfortable when you're relearning how to walk after your orthopedic surgery. Another thing that you will be receiving prior to the surgery, the day before surgery, is the telephone call from surgery scheduling. Now this will happen on the last business day before your surgery. So using the example I had before that um, I, if I had surgery on Monday, I would get the phone call on Friday. Now on Friday they would call me sometime between noon and five. They finish the surgery schedule around noon, noon, so that's when they start calling people and giving them the time to be here. They'll tell you the time to arrive. They'll tell you where to go when you come into the hospital. 
They'll tell you what medications, if any, to take. They'll also tell you when to stop taking anything by mouth, including water, gum, and mints. And then be sure that before you get to that time where they tell you to stop taking anything by mouth, make sure that you take have a nutritious meal because it will be um, a couple hours before you have your next. You want to take your second pre-op shower that evening before your surgery. So back to the Sunday or the Monday morning surgery on Sunday evening, I would be taking my second shower. And you want to also get a good night's sleep because your next day is going to be quite busy and it's going to start fairly early. On the day of surgery, you want to make sure that you wake in time to take that third shower. After you've taken that third shower, remember you're going to need a fresh towel, a fresh wash, or a fresh towel, and fresh clothes to put on. Making sure that those are comfortable clothes that you're wearing, all freshly laundered. Also, make sure that you do not put on any makeup, any lotion, any deodorant, no powders, anything like that. You've gone to all the trouble to get clean using the um, special soap and three whole showers that you really don't want to get dirty again afterwards. You don't want to put any of that cleaning at risk. You also want to remove all jewelry before you come into the hospital. So if you have a tight fitting wedding ring or other jewelry, please make sure that you start taking it off, that you can get it off prior to surgery. We use cautery oftentimes in surgery and it's hot and we don't want to burn you with any jewelry, metal jewelry that you may have on. Other jewelry includes any piercings that you may have because um, we need to have those removed as well. You want to arrive at the hospital at the time that they told you with the pre-op phone call when to arrive. It's typically three hours prior to your surgery, so they will tell you what time to come. And then also bring your suggested items that were on the um, what I spoke of before, the things that you're going to bring in your bag, that overnight bag that you'll have. Don't bring any valuables. Um, send those home with your loved one. Remember to bring your suggested items that are in your, in your bag. Bring your driver's license and your insurance card. And you probably want to send your cell phone home with your loved one or at least have them hang on to it while you, were in, while you are in surgery because most people have their cell phones when they're here in the hospital. That's how you communicate with most folks that are outside of this building. They'll, and they'll know how to get a hold of you easier if you bring your cell phone as well. And then the other thing uh, on the day of surgery is you want to follow directions on where to check in. We have a new system in place for patient and visitor parking. When you pull into a parking space, uh, before you come into the hospital, we request that you pick one of the parking tickets up at the entry to the parking garage, either on your, um, on your way out, it'll give you a timestamp and uh, you need to pay for that at one of the pay for parking stations before returning to your car. Uh, there's a certain fee structure that goes with it. The first 30 minutes is free, um, up to if you're here for more than six hours, it's $4. But if you're coming and going during one day, they, uh, your loved one can stop by the parking office down by the emergency department and they can get a pass that allows them to come and go for that first day or any day for just $3. Um, uh, and the most that you would be charged at any time if your car remains in the parking garage for more than six hours is four dollars. Just don't forget to pick up the parking ticket and don't forget to stop at the pay station before you get to the parking garage. And now that I've walked you through getting to the hospital, Keenan is going to talk to you about your hospital stay and discharge. Hi, my name is Keenan and I'm the evening shift supervisor on the 10 North orthopedic floor. So once you've shown up at the hospital, uh, we'll have you check in at the uh, pre-op check-in desk, which is on, is on the second floor in the hospital. Uh, if you're showing up early enough in the morning, you'll have to come in through the ER entrance, uh, check in there and let them know that you are here for a surgery, and they will show you where um, how to get to the uh, check-in desk up on the second floor. Uh, once you check in at the desk, then they will take you back into uh, the pre-op area uh, where you will meet with your surgeon and your anesthesiologist, uh, both of them going over the surgery and the type of anesthesia that they will be using on you depending on what your medical health history is. Um, we only allow one person in that room with you because it is a small room. Uh, most common types of anesthesia that the surgeons have been using now 
have been a spinal anesthesia uh, with sedation on top of that and a joint cocktail uh, on your hip, knee, or shoulder, whichever you're having surgery on. Uh, the joint cocktail helps reduce the need for narcotics after surgery um, and it, it increases uh, your recovery time uh, from the recovery room to where you can come up to the 10th floor, uh, the orthopedic floor. Uh, while you're down in the recovery room, uh, you will be waiting for the spinal to wear off uh, for you to be able to wiggle your toes and then once you're upstairs with us, once the spinal has completely worn off, then we'll be able to get you up and out of bed. After surgery, your surgeon will meet with your family and yourself, most likely upstairs in your room after they have completed their surgeries for the day. So after, you, after all that, they wheel you into the surgery suite where they will perform your surgery. Um, and then once the surgery is completed, they will take you out into the post-anesthesia care unit or the PACU that we call it for short, the recovery room. While you're in the recovery room, uh, the plan is for you, you will stay in, in there long enough um, to wake up enough from surgery to where you're breathing on your own, uh, you're able to wiggle your toes uh, and start to get some feeling back in your lower limbs. While you're in the recovery room, uh, the nurses down there, uh, they will be doing your vital signs, including your blood pressure, your temperature, uh, taking your oxygen, oxygen, oxygenation levels. Um, they will start you on some pain medication while you're down there um, and start you also with some small sips of water uh, and maybe some ice chips to help you get something into your stomach. Um, once you have recovered down in the recovery room, typically about an hour, uh, they will transfer you up to the 10th floor uh, on, the t on the north side, the orthopedic unit. So after coming up to the 10th floor, after the, from the recovery room, uh, you will check in to your room. Most likely your family will already be in the room waiting for you. Um, you will meet your nurse and the nurse's aide that will be working with you uh, during their shift. Um, we ask that anytime you need anything in the room, you please use your call light uh, for safety. We don't want you getting up and doing anything in the room on your own. Uh, even if you just drop something off the side of your bed, don't try to roll over in the bed to pick it up. Give us a call and we will come in and pick it up for you. Uh, one of our biggest fears that we have with, with patients coming in uh, is pain control. Uh, our surgeons uh, and our staff have done a very good job at providing us with multiple ways to help combat your pain. Um, not only are we using opioids as pain medication, but also Tylenol, ice, uh, anti-inflammatories, actually getting up and moving your, moving and walking on your new joint for a lot of people does reduce the amount of pain that they have. Uh, elevation to help with swelling as well, as well with the ice. Also on the 10th floor, once you're up here with us, uh, the nurse will release all of your orders coming up from uh, the surgery. Uh, once we have released your orders and get your diet order put in the computer, uh, you are able to call down to our uh, kitchen and place your order for your next coming meals. Uh, if it's later in the evening, we ask people to order their dinner as well as their breakfast for the next day, just so that you don't have to get up extra early to order that and it's already in our system. It can be delivered to you on time. So this is the incentive spirometer. Uh, we use this to help patients take deep breaths, expand their lungs, um, ward off the possibility of developing pneumonia from the fluid that collects in the bases of your lungs while you're laying on your back during the surgery. So in the incentive spirometer here, uh, there's two different chambers here. There's a large one and a small one. I'll explain the small one first. It's on the side here and there's a little plunger in there with two arrows. And the idea is, is as you're taking your slow deep breath in, you want to pull this little plunger up and keep it in between the two arrows. As you're hovering that little piece in the two air, between the two arrows, this larger plunger in the larger uh, cylinder will raise up and you can use the arrows here to mark how high you're getting that. The idea is to take slow deep breaths 
causing you to, to expand your lungs because anyone can take a fast, quick breath and peg this thing to the top and it's not necessarily getting, you're not necessarily getting the best or greatest benefit out of the incentive spirometer. Um, our ideal goal is 10 deep breaths per minute while you're awake. Uh, you don't have to wake up to do this. I usually tell my patients five at the top of the hour, five deep breaths at the bottom of the hour, or one or two deep breaths during each commercial break. This will go home with you. Continue using it at home as well. Some things you may wake up with from surgery. Um, one of them is a hemovac drain. Um, we see this most commonly with our knee surgeries rather than our hip surgeries. What this is, is after, at the end of surgery, if they deem that you need one of these, they make one final incision on the lateral aspect of your knee and the last 12 or 12 inches or so of this tubing is perforated. There's a bunch of little holes in here. Uh, they insert this under the skin uh, and they stitch it in place. So if you wake up and you have one of these, please don't pull on it, it will hurt. Once it's in place, in the canister here, there's three little springs. They compress the springs, plug up the hole, and then over time as those springs expand, it creates a vacuum and it pulls out all that excess, excess blood uh, and fluid in your knee, which will help greatly reduce the amount of swelling that you have. Um, this will be taken out usually the day after surgery in the morning, uh, once the surgeon has taken a look at your uh, blood levels and the amount of blood loss that you have had throughout the day of surgery and the first night after surgery. Something else you may wake up with is a Foley catheter. Most of our surgeons have gotten away from using the Foley catheter. One benefit to that is it forces you to get up and walk more, go into the bathroom using your nude total joint. Again, like with the hemovac drain, if you wake up with one of these Foley catheters, please do not pull on it. This tip, the end of the catheter, is inserted in your urethra and up into your bladder and there's a balloon in here that we blow up and it's about the size of a golf ball, maybe a little bit smaller and that sits at the bottom of your bladder uh, preventing the catheter from falling out. So if you feel that in there it does trigger some people to have to have the urge to urinate that does pass within about an hour or two for most people. Um, the goal with this is to have it removed by six o'clock the day after surgery, so the morning after surgery uh, so that you're then up and moving on your own, get or not on your own, but up and moving with staff members to get in and out to use the restroom. We're going to talk a little bit now about blood management here at the hospital. Uh, Providence does have a leading edge program for blood management. Uh, you have all been evaluated before surgery, most likely in your surgeon's office. Uh, you've had labs drawn to uh, get a baseline for your blood levels. Um, and then after surgery, while you're here, you will also have your blood drawn to use as a comparison uh, to where you were before the surgery. Uh, here at the hospital for our orthopedic patients, the use of blood transfusions has decreased greatly over the past several years. Um, some things that the doctors are doing uh, to combat the, to need the use of a blood transfusion, one of the major ones is given IV iron to patients. Uh, based on how, what the blood drop, or what the blood level drop has been before surgery to after surgery. The surgeons also use many other uh, modalities to help reduce the need for a blood transfusion, such as medications uh, like prenatal vitamins, which are high in iron, as well as changing uh, diet recommendations for patients to eat foods high in uh, iron content prior to coming in for surgery and then also in preparation, and then also after surgery once they have discharged home. Continuing with blood, we're going to talk now a little bit about DVT or deep vein thrombosis, also known as blood clots. First we're going to talk about prevention of blood clots. The first thing we have people do is ankle pumps. So laying in bed or sitting at the chair, um, 
just pumping your ankles back and forth. The idea is that it mimics walking, flexing the muscles in your lower uh, legs, which in return pumps the blood back up to your heart, uh, which reduces the amount of stagnant blood sitting in your uh, lower legs. Everyone will receive sequential compression devices, or SCDs for short. They act as little foot massagers. Um, what they do is each foot will have a little pump on them, which is then tied to a pump, uh, a motor that hangs off the foot of your bed. When that's turned on, one foot pump will pump up lightly and squeeze your foot, and then relax over time, and then it'll switch over to the other foot. Again, pumping up, giving you a slight squeeze in your foot, and then relaxing. Uh, again, just like with the ankle pumps, the idea is that it mimics walking and the flexing of the muscles in your feet uh, and helps pump the blood back up to your heart. Early ambulation. Uh, you will be up and moving the day of surgery. Uh, if not the day of surgery, that first night we will get you up and short go for a short walk. The idea is again, moving, pumping the blood back through the system so that it's not just sitting and pooling in your legs, which is uh, what causes the blood clots. Also anticoagulation therapy, so medications that the surgeons use. Uh, for example, aspirin, uh, heparin shots, or Lovenox injections. So we've talked about prevention of blood clots. Let's move on to the symptoms that you may see with blood clots. First one listed there is calf pain. So this is pain not at your surgical site, it's below the surgical site, down in your calf. Uh, if, you start to come, if you start to suffer some pain in your calf, let your nurse know. We can do what's called a Homan sign, uh, where we test um, to see if it's uh, up for a blood clot, or uh, the idea of a blood clot. Uh, also burning pain, again, not at your incision site, it's below that. Uh, increased swelling. You will have swelling from the surgery. That is very typical. Uh, this is increased swelling uh, more so than what is normal. And then redness. Uh, the pooling of the blood tends to cause your lower limb to be warm uh, with some redness from the blood. Now we're going to talk about some signs and symptoms of infections. Uh, a fever greater than 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Typically after surgery, a slight temperature or elevation in temperature is normal. Your body has just gone through a major surgery and it's doing all this extra work to start the healing process already. I usually explain it to people as the same as going out and mowing your yard in the middle of the afternoon. You're doing all this extra work. Your body temperature does rise from that. Um, but having a temperature higher than 105 is, uh, is our threshold. Incision redness and warmth. You will have redness at the incision site. That's part of the typical uh, healing process and some warmth. It's if that redness increases or it starts to expand uh, away from the incision site as well as the warmth. Another sign uh, is incisional drainage. Uh, again, some incisional drainage is typical. Some blood or serous sanguinous fluid that we call it's a little it's clear. Uh, sometimes it dries onto the dressing a little yellowish. Uh, but if that amount of drainage increases, uh, that's usually a sign or of an uh, infection. Um, another sign or symptom of an infection, tired or flu-like symptoms here in the hospital or once you discharge home. You will be tired after having a surgery. It is a major surgery. But if you just become exhausted to where you can't get up and do your short walks at home or uh, you're just too exhausted to get out of bed or you have flu-like symptoms, that would be cause for concern and we would want you to call your surgeon's office. Aside from pain, nausea and constipation tend to be our two biggest concerns that patients have coming in for surgery. For nausea, uh, we always recommend that you take food with your pain medication while you're here in the hospital and drink lots of fluid. You've been, you haven't had anything to eat since dinner the night before surgery, uh, so your stomach is empty. We don't want you putting pain pills or really any medication in your stomach when it's empty. Uh, that tends to increase your chance of becoming nauseous. 
If you are starting to feel nauseous, please let your nurse know. Uh, the surgeons have done a very good job at giving us multiple medications as options to help with, uh, with nausea, your anti-nausea medications. Uh, our big one is get, but our big one is getting food in your system prior to giving you medications. So along with nausea, constipation is another one of our biggest concerns that patients have. Everyone will be started on bowel medications after surgery, stool softeners, bowel stimulants, laxatives. You will get them twice a day while you're here. I always tell my patients they do not work instantly. You're not going to swallow these pills and then have to be in the bathroom in 30 minutes. It is typical to go about a day after surgery without a bowel movement, even while taking the bowel medications. Uh, once you're at home, continue taking your bowel medications, even if you've had bowel movements, as long as you're taking uh, narcotics for pain. Diet, uh, foods high in fiber uh, will help prevent constipation. Uh, and then also fluids, making sure you're taking lots of fluids in. Another side benefit of that is that you're up, if you're drinking lots of fluids, you need to get up and use the restroom more. So that motility, mobility helps with the motility in your gut in preventing constipation. So the day after surgery, hopefully you've had a good night's sleep here at the hospital. Most commonly, people discharge the day after surgery. 98% of the people discharging on that day do go home. That is the plan from the very beginning, is to get you to go home, not necessarily to a skilled nursing facility or to a rehab center. Mobility, we want you to continue walking while you're at home, uh, but here in the hospital, anytime you're up or want to go for a walk, you need to have a staff member with you. Uh, physical therapy, if they have not worked with you on the day of surgery, they will be working you working with you the day after surgery prior to clearing you for going home. With pain management, hopefully hopefully we have become or we've come up with an idea and a regimen that works for you. Our plan is hopefully to get you to non-narcotic pain medication as quickly as possible. Continue with your deep breathing with your incentive spirometer. Again, 10 deep breaths per minute. Uh, and prepare for 9 a.m. training with either physical therapy, your nurse, um, or your discharge planners in preparation for getting home later that day. Know that this may be later than 9 a.m. Uh, not everyone is available at that time. Once your surgeon has rounded or their PA and they have cleared you to go home, they will write discharge orders uh, and your nurse will go over all of that information with you and you will be taken down to the discharge lobby. The idea of the discharge lobby is that it is just for patients who are discharging. Your loved one can drive the car right up to the curb. It is The discharge lobby is staffed with a nurse and a nurse's aide, and they will be able to help you in a wheelchair get from the wheelchair into your car. If you are having your prescriptions filled here at the hospital, we fax those prescriptions down prior to you going down to the discharge lobby, and the discharge lobby delivers them to you, or the pharmacy delivers them to you in the discharge lobby. You don't have to stop by the pharmacy to pick them up. The only caveat with that is if you have Kaiser insurance, they have a different um, plan for your for filling your prescriptions upon discharge. For the person who's coming to take you home, uh, the idea is that they would have a front wheel walker in the car for you when you get here. That way you, it's in the car when you go home or you will be provided one from the hospital. Uh, if your insurance if your insurance covers that. So you've had your surgery, you've recovered, you're good, you've left the hospital. Continuation at home, um, continue with your exercises. They're in the little, uh, the total joint care notebook that has been provided to you as well as the ones that physical therapy has gone over and would like you to continue with. Continue with your deep breathing. You have all taken your incentive spirometer home with you, so we would like you to continue to use your deep your incentive spirometer for your deep breathing. Remember, 10 deep breaths per minute. Diet, foods high in fiber will help you have bowel movements and prevent constipation. DVT prophylactics, so preventing blood clots. Again, activity, getting up and moving around, drinking plenty of water, Continue with the medications that the doctors have provided 
for you, whether it be your aspirin or your Lovenox shots. Mon continue to monitor your dressing for signs and symptoms of an infection. Look for the, again, the increase in, in the redness around the incision or the drainage on the dressing. Pain management at home. It's a good idea for that first night to set an alarm to, w to remind you to wake up roughly every three to four hours, assess how your pain is, and take pain medication if needed. Try not to miss those doses throughout the night if you need them. The worst thing you could do is skip those, medic skip those times at night, and then in the morning you're just playing catch up, uh, which doesn't usually go very well. While you're taking your opioids, remember you need to continue with your bowel meds. You will receive a follow-up phone call from the transitional care coordinators after discharge to make sure you got home with everything that you needed and that the transition from the hospital to home went smoothly. If you have any questions uh, once you're at home, please feel free to call the discharge or your transitional care coordinators. Their phone number is provided in this slideshow. And thank you very much. During your hospital stay, you and your care coach will be working with a physical and an occupational therapist. I'm Darlene, one of the PTs, or physical therapists, and I'll be talking to you for a bit about our role in therapy and what you can expect. We will be teaching you a home exercise program that has been specifically designed for flexibility and strengthening to help you move more normally again. We'll also make sure that you are safe with mobility activities, such as walking, getting in and out of a bed, a car, and on and off furniture to help you prepare for home. Our emphasis will be on safety as we know that there is a higher risk for fall initially after any surgery. And this is in part due to the pain medication coming off of anesthesia. And also many of our patients are connected to uh, different lines such as IVs and perhaps a catheter. It also takes some time for your body to adapt to the new joint. So initially your balance may be off a bit. Another important part of safe healing is good hand washing. Those staff members who will be caring for you are washing their hands, and we also expect you to have good hand hygiene. We'll be giving you a small bottle of hand gel, and there will also be dispensers on the wall and a sink in your room. So it is very important that you not get up without staff. Once your care coach has been cleared by PT, your coach can also provide supervision for you if staff is not in the room. And please bring in any items from home that will help us to care for you. If appropriate, items such as hearing aids, glasses, shoes, and braces that you would normally wear at home, please bring those in, as well as if you have a walker. And we're going to get into more detail on that in a few slides. But if you have a, a walker, please bring that in with you. You'll be given a safety belt or a gate belt when you come to the hospital. And this will come in handy as we show your care coach how they will use it when they're guarding you when you're performing stairs. And also you can use it to help your surgical leg on and off the bed if needed at first. Kind of like this. It also comes in handy for working on your range of motion exercises. People coming in for total joint replacement surgery, understandably, are concerned about the pain that they will experience. And yes, there will be pain, but it will, it will be a different kind of pain than that deep joint pain that you have from arthritis that many of you are likely experiencing right now. Post-op pain is due to the swelling and the, the uh, stiffness that comes from surgery. And the good news is this pain will improve. It does get better and it will eventually go away. Pain management is an essential part of your treatment for a good hospital experience and for optimal outcomes. At the hospital, we use a 0 to 10 pain rating scale with 0 being no pain and 10 being the worst pain you can imagine. We would expect that your pain would be worse with movement as compared to when you're resting. For example, you may rate your pain as a 3 out of 10 when you're not moving and it may increase to a 6 out of 10 when you're up and moving around. That would be pretty typical. We want to help you manage your pain, and our goal is to help you bring that pain level back down within a short period of time after your activity is finished, closer to what the number was at the baseline. We find it works best if we are proactive with the pain, rather than waiting for it to become a problem. 
and we help you to manage your pain in a variety of ways. First of all, during surgery, you'll receive an injection of a pain cocktail, and that will be inserted into the surgical area, and it helps to stay in your system for so several hours after surgery. This period of time when the anesthesia is still in your system, we often refer to as the honeymoon period, and we'll be talking more about that in just a moment. Other ways that we help manage your pain, PT and OT will always check with your nurse and coordinate your therapy sessions around the pain medication times. Please do take your medication that's been prescribed for you so that you can comfortably participate with the therapist and the nurses as they help you move. Ice and elevation are also very important parts of pain reduction. They help to reduce swelling, which in turn will help with the post-op pain. We'll also be teaching you breathing and relaxation techniques and also show you how to avoid overdoing, especially during the honeymoon period. So let's talk about that honeymoon period for a moment. Folks do not stay in the hospital very long these days, one to two days on average. As I mentioned earlier, the anesthesia stays in the system for a while after surgery, and it's during this time that our patients often report little to no pain. So as you can imagine, patients tend to want to overdo during this time period when they do not hurt. Many times patients will ask if they can walk the entire unit all at one time. Some people say things like, honey, you don't understand. The amount of pain I was having before surgery was awful. And now that that pain is gone, well, I just want to keep walking. And if we allow that to happen, then it will likely become very difficult to get on top of the pain management later. So it's best to avoid that completely. Often is the second and third day after surgery where the pain is at its worst. So please allow us to help you to gradually progress your activity safely. As this, point, this slide points out, walking is vitally important for each of us. It's important for our total sense of well-being and our overall health. Many of you are here right now because you want to be able to walk better. That's why you're preparing to have joint surgery. It's a measurement for quality of life and especially important following surgery. Walking helps to reduce the risk for blood clots, manage pain, it helps reduce swelling, and it helps to regain strength and flexibility around that new joint. Depending on the time of your surgery, you will get up out of bed either with a nurse or a physical therapist. And many people tolerate walking the very day or evening of their surgery. Research shows, and we certainly experience this with our patients, that the sooner you can get moving after surgery, and the most often taking short little walks, helps to give you optimal outcomes and quicker recovery. Now you'll be seeing your physical and occupational therapist likely just once a day, but you will need to take several short little walks while you're here at the hospital. And we want you to start initiating that here, taking responsibility for that, just like you're going to do when you get home, short and frequent walks. So the way this works, they're not scheduled with the nurses, but you initiate by calling the nurse. We need to use the bathroom, or if you just feel like taking a walk around the room or a short walk in the hallway. Remember, every walk counts. It's not the distance that we're worried about, but it's really the frequency and the quality of your walking. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the quality on the next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we do not want you overdoing and paying for it later. So we will actually limit your walking distance. We find that limiting people to about 50 feet maximum at one time on the day of surgery and after the first day, 100 feet maximum at one time, seems to help to prevent unnecessary pain spikes as your anesthesia is wearing off. Now don't worry, you'll be able to walk further distances than that and your physical therapist will help you to understand how to gradually increase that distance once you get home. As I mentioned earlier, walking quality is our focus, not so much the distance, because that will come later. For many of you that have been dealing with this arthritis pain, it's been a long time since you've been able to walk normally, and we don't expect that to change overnight. But the exercises that we're going to teach you and the one-to-one -one instruction by your physical therapist will help you in time to start walking more normally again. Now after surgery, you will be allowed weight bearers tolerating. And what that means is that you can put as much weight on that surgical leg that you can tolerate. In fact, weight doesn't hurt it, it helps it to heal. Putting weight on the leg will help stimulate bone growth and help the healing of the muscles and the bones around your new joint. 
that being said, we understand that um, post-op pain will be there, and so it may be a challenge to put much weight on initially. But I can tell you that most of our patients have a very positive um, feeling after surgery, the first time they get up to walk, that that deep joint pain is gone, and now they're just dealing with the post-op pain. And many people say that they're actually able to walk better right after surgery than they were leading up to the surgery. So while we will encourage you to do the weight bearers tolerated, let's be clear that every patient who's had total joint replacement surgery will walk with an assistive device after surgery. If you have a front wheeled walker, please have your care coach bring it with you the day of surgery. And then once you're assigned a room, she or he can bring that walker to your, to your new room. Now don't worry if you do not have a walker to bring with you to the hospital. Your physical therapist will arrange for you to have one before you go home. And if you do bring one, we'll be happy to show you how to correctly adjust the height and we can even do that for you. Another option, if you'd like, is to have your doctor write a prescription for you, and you can pick up a walker before you come in. But please make sure it's the two-wheeled kind, and I'd like to show you now how to adjust it for the proper height. And this is the way that we um, adjust for proper height and we measure for patients. When a person is standing inside of the walker with the arms resting down by the side in a natural resting position, the wrist should come right at the top of that handpiece on the walker. That way there will be a slight bend in the elbow and that's what we would like. Generally speaking, our patients will be using their walker for about four weeks after surgery. This will allow for optimal safety and to ensure that there's adequate strength and flexibility for you to be able to walk as normally as possible. You don't want to go back to limping or having to hold on to furniture for stability like you did before surgery just because you stopped using the walker sooner than you should have. So your follow-up physical therapist will help you to determine when you no longer need to use the device. And speaking of follow-up therapy, typically our total knee replacement patients will receive either outpatient or home therapy. Or home therapy. Total hip patients, it's really not indicated for in most circumstances. So yes, stair training. Your physical therapist will help you to learn how to walk safely up and down stairs before you are discharged home. We're not going to get into specifics at this time because many different things will determine the type of technique that we will have you practice with. Things like if you have a rail at home, if you have no rails, are there entry stairs or just inside steps? And it also depends on how well you're moving after surgery. So please be prepared for you and your care coach to set up a training time the day after surgery, surgery. It's important, like we told you before, to have your care coach here by nine o'clock the morning after surgery, because that's the time that the different care team members will begin arranging training times for you. And yes, we'll be showing you and your care coach how to walk up and down stairs. You know, it's best if you can to have an alternative plan when you go home, if possible, to have a bed on the main level because you may not feel up to doing stairs initially. If you have an option, prepare for that. As far as car transfers go, again, we are not going to get into any specifics at this time because so many things depend on how you're moving, what kind of car you have, and what your particular surgery was. You may have some precautions, some movement precautions after surgery that we'll be explaining to you. So there may be new techniques that we teach you on safe ways to get in and out of a car. Many of you are already doing techniques that have been working for you. But we may have some tips, things such as putting a plastic sack on a cloth seat to help you slide better. So again, once you're in the hospital after surgery, your physical therapist will talk to you about the best way for you to go in and out of your car. Yes, there will be exercises, and you'll want to do them because they're going to really help you to be able to walk more normally again and to really rehab this, this knee or hip joint. Everyone will be getting a book like this, and the exercises are inside this. On page 17 and 18, there's a pre-op section. We really want you to do those exercises the best you can before you come to surgery. We find that when people do those exercises prior to their surgery, they have an easier time performing them, performing them afterwards. There's something called muscle memory that you've probably heard of, and it just means by doing these exercises now with some repetition, like is suggested in the booklet, it will help to your body to remember how to do them later on. 
when you're under some pain medication and some anesthesia that's wearing off and maybe it will be more difficult to retain some information. So please do them the best you can. We know that you have arthritis and there will be some that will be challenging for you, but just do them within your pain-free range. And if there are any that are um, especially difficult and bring you too much pain, then please just omit those and um, we'll teach you how to modify things when you come to the hospital. You'll want to do the, the exercises on your bed. Please do not try to crawl down the floor. Most people can't get back up again. And really after surgery, we want you doing those on your bed as well because we don't want you crawling around on that, on that incision um, following your surgery. So yeah, just do them on your own bed. And it tells you how many times a day to do these exercises. And just like the walking, it's important to do them frequently so that you can prevent scar tissue, especially during the um, critical window of time right after surgery when scar tissue likes to develop. And so please be faithful about the frequency that is suggested and not to overdo. Like we talked about with the walking distance, it's important that you not overdo um, so that you have excessive pain that may be hard to control later. Also, you can have more swelling than you need to if you were to overdo. So if you just stick to what's written in the book, um, it's intentional, we put those there on purpose, the recommendations for uh, frequency. So please stick to that and you'll have, um, I think, good success. The post-op exercises are on page 29 and you'll notice that they're very similar to the pre-op exercises with some change in the recommended uh, amount of repetitions. You'll be going over all those exercises with your physical therapist after surgery. And remember, we wanna work with you within your pain tolerance and we're gonna be showing you strategies um, on how to tolerate the pain while doing the exercises. Things like the breathing and relaxation and how to gradually progress. And knowing that the, the, the rehab is gonna take a while, so just be prepared for maybe sometimes feeling like your exercise is harder than other times. It's like that with anything. Um, sometimes, it's just, sometimes it's just harder to go to the gym than other times. So just be patient with it. And if you stay with it, um, our patients will testify that um, they were glad that they did. In addition to physical therapy, you will also be working with an occupational therapist on activities of daily living, or ADLs, things such as getting dressed, showering, and toileting and hygiene. She, he or she will evaluate your abilities to determine if you might benefit from pieces of equipment or adaptive devices to help restore independence as you are preparing for returning home. And your care coach will also be trained if you need assistance with these activities. Your occupational therapist will see you the day after surgery and will help you get into your own comfortable clothing. We recommend items that are loose fitting that are easy to get on and off and many patients prefer basketball shorts. It's also good to bring supportive shoes or slippers with you. Depending on what type of surgery that you have, you may have some movement restrictions or precautions and your therapist will explain to you what those are, as well as show you techniques on how to adhere to those precautions when doing your activities of daily living. You will have the opportunity to try some devices that you might find helpful as you perform activities of daily living. Things such as a long-handled shoehorn, this long-handled reacher, or a sock aid. Now insurance companies typically do not cover these type of items, but on page 37 and 38 in your booklet, we've provided you with a resource list of local vendors where these things can be purchased. You can also go online and work through Amazon. You may or may not need an elevated toilet seat. See what your OT recommends for you after they work with you at the hospital. We have already discussed the importance of good hand hygiene for you and your caregivers in preventing post-op infections. Remember, this is very important. Now I'd like to talk to you about safety for a moment. Some things that you can do to help prepare your home now to be safer when you come home from surgery. Remember the vendor list on page 37 and 38 will give you some ideas of where you can purchase a bath or shower seat. You will be allowed to shower two to three days after surgery and you'll be having a water resistant bandage over your incision, it's best to leave that alone. You will not need to have any extra protective covering over it when you bathe. Other safety considerations for when you return home. Take a look around the house and make sure that there are no potential tripping hazards. Things like loose throw rugs or exposed cords. Make sure and keep your walk-in area clutter free. 
Use your walker as directed, and please don't try to carry items while walking. You might want to get a walker tray or a bag to help carry items. Good idea to keep your cell phone with you as well. If you have any other therapy-related questions, please jot them down, and you can discuss it with your therapist when you get here. We want to thank you for being here, for choosing Providence, and we certainly look forward to working with you and your new joint. And now that you listen to my little spiel, I have a surprise for you. I've written a song especially for you. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll recognize the tune. It's a new joint after all. It's a new joint after all. Be careful people, don't you fall. It's a brand new joint. It's a joint that bends. It's a joint that kicks. It will help you stand. It will help you sit. It will help you move, we are sure of it. It's a new joint after all. Your ortho doctor, he fixed it good. Did just what we knew he would. Now do your rehab, come on dude. It's a brand new joint. Thank you.